Good morning. I feel like I'm going back to a bit of my heritage this morning. Dear Lord and Father of Mankind is a, a proper Anglican hymn. And uh, for those who are wondering, this is Douglas Tartan. Um, this is about as Scottish as you'll ever see me. I don't plan to ever wear a kilt. Uh, so this is as far as it goes. Um, yeah, but I do have Scottish blood on my paternal line. Uh, so I usually say, tell people, if, if the UK was in, it was in Africa, I would be considered Scottish. Uh, but that's not how we consider things where I come from, so I'm considered English. Good. Um, if you could have uh, Lamentations 3 open, we'll be continuing um, in to, and finishing off the chapter from verse uh, 34 through to the end of the chapter this morning, uh, as the Lord uh, enables us. And just as you're opening, um, I wonder as you look at the world around us, what you would give, if I were to ask you the, the, the injustices that go on um, and seem to go on unabated, seem to go on uh, with no justice uh, ever coming forth as far as we can see. Perhaps the top of our mind right now would be uh, the uh, many things that are going on in the Ukraine. Perhaps as Kenyans we would think back to 2007, 2008, the post-election violence, for which, as far as I can tell, no one has ever been brought to bear. Perhaps you have your own examples of injustice and you wonder... It's been so long. Doesn't the Lord see this? Doesn't the Lord care about this? Does he approve this? What, what is going on? And that's a question we'll really look at as we go through Lamentations 3. Um, and I don't want you to assume that the, this passage only applies to situations of injustice, but I think uh, it does especially apply there. But allow me to read, then I'll pray a brief prayer of illumination, and then we'll dive into the text. Uh, just one warning before I begin the reading in verse 36. If you, I, I will be uh, going with the ESV uh, translation. In verse 36, you'll notice, you, or if you're following along in the ESV, you may notice I'll make a slight adjustment to the translation there. I will explain uh, what that's all about when we get there, uh, but just... just uh, for you to be aware of that ahead of time. So Lamentations 3 from verse 34 through 66. To crush underfoot all the prisoners of the earth, to deny a man justice in the presence of the Most High, to subvert a man in his lawsuit, does the Lord not see? Who has spoken and it came to pass, unless the Lord has commanded it? Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that good and bad come? Why should a living man complain? A man about the punishment of his sins. Let us test and examine our ways and return to the Lord. We have transgressed. Oh, uh, let us lift up our hearts and hands to God in heaven. Sorry. We have transgressed and rebelled and you have not forgiven. You have wrapped yourself with anger and pursued us, killing without pity. You have wrapped yourself with a cloud so that no prayer can pass through. You have made us scum and garbage among the peoples. All our enemies open their mouths against us. Panic and pitfall have come upon us, devastation and destruction. My eyes flow with rivers of tears because of the destruction of the daughter of my people. My eyes will flow without ceasing, without respite, until the Lord from heaven looks down and sees. My eyes cause me grief at the fate of of all the daughters of my city. I have been hunted like a bird by those who were my enemies without cause. They flung me alive into the pit and cast stones on me. Water closed over my head. I said, I am lost. I called on your name, O Lord, from the depths of the pit. You heard my plea. Do not close your ears to my cry for help. You came near when I called on you. You said, do not fear. You have taken up my cause, O Lord. You have redeemed my life. You have seen the wrong done to me, O Lord. Judge my cause. 
You have seen all their vengeance, all their plots against you. You have heard their taunts, O Lord, all their plots against me. The lips and thoughts of my assailants are against me all the day long. Behold their sitting and their rising. I am the object of their taunts. You will repay them, O Lord, according to the work of their hands. You will give them dullness of heart. Your curse will be on them. You will pursue them in anger and destroy them from under your heavens. Oh Lord. Lord, as we approach this hard text, we are tempted to ask this question. Whether it is something that you see when there is injustice rife, when prisoners are crushed and cases are subverted and justice seems so far from us. Yet teach us, Lord, by your word. Remind us, Lord, and help us not only to see the injustice that is done against us, but to see where we are part of the problem, so that we also may repent and turn back to you, even as the poet counseled his peers. We pray that the unfolding of your word would bring light. That the words of my mouth, the meditation of each one of our hearts, will be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So in the second half of this chapter, it's as though the poet anticipates the objection that his people are probably feeling right now. Sure, you've said that the Lord does not cast off forever. Sure, you've said that his steadfast love never ceases. His mercy never comes to an end. And that's what we looked at last week. Sure, you've said that. But haven't you looked around you lately? Haven't you seen what's going on? Haven't you seen the way we're being crushed under the feet of the Babylonians? The way justice is being denied to us? The way our lawsuits are being subverted? Haven't you seen that? And it's that that the poet now turns to. Haven't you seen the bodies lying in the streets? That is, those who've been left alone. Not to mention those who we'll get to in chapter 4, who have been boiled for food. Haven't you seen... How can you say the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases when you're looking at such a situation? And so the poet addresses that. And he does so in kind of three stages. First, he reassures them, yes, God does see. And as a result of seeing, will at the appropriate time deal with all oppression, all injustice. But then he shows them the right path to follow while they're waiting, while they're wondering when God will see. What should we do in the meantime? And then he'll set forth the example of his own situation of suffering that he faced, where he faced injustice. And he sets that as an example that the Lord has seen and dealt with him kindly in that. And so we'll just look at those points consecutively. First of all, God does see, or perhaps we could say God will see. And second point, until God sees. And then the third point, God has seen. So God will see. And as we turn to that point, let me explain why I did a slightly adjusted translation of verse 36. The, the word at the end of verse 36, if you're reading uh, in, in the ESV, which I know most of us probably are, the word is written there, approve. The word literally is see. Um, it's used elsewhere in the chapter in 59, uh, 60. Uh, there's another place. Um, until the Lord looks down and sees. Uh, that's, uh, yeah, for 50. So it's used in 50, 59, and 60. And in the other places it's translated see, and nowhere else in the whole Old Testament is this word translated approve. Um, and, and what I think the author is doing 
He's using this keyword C, and if you notice, my title is, is based on that keyword C, does the Lord not see? And, and he's using it in a rhetorical question. Now, in Hebrew, they don't have punctuation, or they didn't have punctuation the way we would tend to understand punctuation. There's nothing like a question mark that you'll ever find in the Bible. Now, there are times when you would easily uh, look at the Hebrew and say, oh, this is a question. But there are other times when the author doesn't necessarily tell you clearly that this is a question. But you interpret that from the context. Um, and he's about to go in verse 37 to 39 to list a number of other rhetorical questions. And so that's why I think the translation, does the Lord not see, makes a lot more sense here. He's asking, do you think the Lord doesn't see this? No, he sees it. Of course, expecting the answer, yes, the Lord sees. Of course the Lord sees. The Lord doesn't look on blindly. And nor does he turn his face to the side. He sees. So that's, that's where I, I, I got the, the translation from. Um, I think it's just uh, probably a better way of, of rendering it. Um, the ESV does a fantastic job. And, and all modern translations, by the way, do a fantastic job of, of bringing God's word to us. This is one where I think the NIV gets it a bit, a bit better than the ESV. Um, so if you're following the NIV, you might not have realized that I made even any, any major adjustment there. Because I think it says, would the Lord not see these things? And again, obviously the answer is yes, the Lord sees. That's the answer that David gives in Psalm 143. He complains, the enemy has pursued my soul. He has crushed my life to the ground. That word crush that we saw in verse 34. He has made me sit in darkness like those long dead. And then he confidently asserts, just a, a, a verse or two later, in your steadfast love, you will cut off my enemies and you will destroy all the adversaries of my soul. Oh, the Lord sees that crushing that David experiences and he will in due time repay. Or Exodus 23, the command is given in verse, I think it's verse 6, you shall not pervert the justice due to your poor in his lawsuit. To deny a man justice in the presence of the Most High? Oh, you shall not do that. What, what is the threat? Oh, I will not acquit the wicked, God says. God sees injustice. One more example, Proverbs 22. I don't know why I've not written the verse number, but you, you'll easily be able to find it. Do not rob the poor because he is poor, or crush the afflicted at the gate, for the Lord will plead their cause. He sees when a cause is subverted, when a lawsuit is subverted, and he himself pleads that cause. And what will he do to those who subverted it? He will rob of life those who rob them. Indeed, Jeremiah himself received the promise of God for Israel. Behold, I will plead your cause and take vengeance for you. Jeremiah 51, verse 36. Injustice and oppression have always been abhorrent to God. And he has declared his opposition to them in strong terms throughout the scriptures. He sees. And that should be a comfort to those who experience suffering as a result of oppression. Whether it be political systems, whether it be personal enemies. But it should also be a terror to those who are perpetrators of such actions. And, and the poet here is playing on that double meaning. He's about, he's not only comforting them that this oppression that you're going through will cease, he's also telling them, repent. That's what he's about to go and do uh, just a few verses later in verse 40. Uh, if you have been part of this, don't, only, don't be comforted only by God's words. God's words, it's been said, uh, are to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. And that's exactly what's going on here. Notice that Jeremiah 51, 36, which I just quoted, is directed against the Babylonians. It's not merely a comfort to the Israelites, but it is a terror to the Babylonians. Because he will repay them. And if you read through uh, Jeremiah 51, the whole chapter, you realize it's, it's heavy stuff. It's, it's uh, I think apart from Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the Bible, and it's all about the destruction of Babylon because of what they have done against Israel. 
But it's not only for those who are out there. This is a word for those who are in Judah, in Jerusalem. And we're going to see that later on in the chapter. This is a word for all who would oppress, for all who would be unjust. And it stands against them. Now, the poet immediately goes on to say that God's experience or or God's interaction with suffering is not merely at the level of seeing. He is much more intimately connected with our, with, with, uh, our suffering and our, even our, the injustice that is done against us, much more intimately connected than merely seeing. No, he is behind it in some sense. Who has spoken and it came to pass unless the Lord has commanded it? Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that good and bad come? Very similar words are used in the psalm to say, from the mouth of God... He created all things. If he created all things, he's sovereign over all things. So from his mouth, not only comes creation, but comes all things that happen. He is sovereign. Even that name most high speaks to that. And this is the only place, uh, just verse 35, verse 30, uh, what is that, 38. Those are the only two places in in Lamentations where the name Elyon, most high, is used of God. And just emphasizing on his sovereign control over all things, that no one could be afflicting you if he had not allowed it, if he had not even commanded it, the poet goes as far as to say. And we saw that kind of a little bit in chapter 2. Do you remember the the enemy was uh, was kind of gleefully crying crying out, sorry for that, was gleefully crying out, that's a tricky one, Um, we have swallowed up. And God says, uh, no. It's me that has swallowed up Israel. You have merely done what I commanded long ago. And I know in our day, some people would try and take comfort from from in affliction and say, the Lord would, would remove this if he could. This is not God's will for us. If he if he was just able to overcome, but he'll turn it for good. No, he is behind it. That's that's the comfort that that the poet takes. Like, if he is the one who brought it, then he is the one who can heal it. Jeremiah, elsewhere, I can't remember exactly where in Jeremiah, he talks about the fact that Judah's wound or Jerusalem's wound is so grievous, none can heal it apart from the one who inflicted it. I can assure you, if, if it was the Babylonians acting on their own accord that were inflicting it, they have no interest in healing it. No, it's God. Who can heal this wound? The bad comes from God's hand just as the good does. Very closely kind of echoing the words that Job also said when he faced great affliction. And what conclusion does the poet draw? One that we might find it difficult to receive, I would suggest. He says, verse 39, Why should a living man complain, a man about the punishment of his sins? Right? If you're still alive, he says, you have no reason to complain. And we'd be like, what what do you mean? What do you mean? I have no reason to complain just because I'm alive? That's the question that would come through. If if he were were alive today, we'd say, ah, this this guy is too insensitive. He needs to understand us. Now, one, one kind of caveat, the word complain here is the kind of moaning and grumbling that the Israelites did in the desert. It's, the word is used in Numbers 11 one to describe just that. It's, it's a moaning and groaning kind of complaining. We have uh, every, every it's, it's very much appropriate for us to go and raise our complaints before God, but not in a moaning, grumbling kind of way. As uh, uh, we met with our, uh, they're supposed to be called life groups, we still call ours RMG, which got Salim in trouble when he did announcements a few weeks ago. But um, we met last week after, after service, um, and one of the things we, we, we kind of just touched upon is there's a faithful way to ask a question, and there's a faithless way. The difference between um, Zechariah and, and Mary, right? They're both asking, how could this be? Like, my wife's, on the one hand, my wife's barren. On the other hand, I'm a virgin. How, how can I get a child? They're both asking the same question. One of them is judged for that question. The other one is treated very, very warmly for that question and and gets an answer to the question. There's a faithful way to complain and there's a faithless way to complain. 
and it's the faithless way to complain that the author is talking about here. So, so it's not right for us to complain because at the end of the day, this is not an injustice. It may be on the human level. Don't get me wrong. It may be a great injustice on the human level, but on the divine level, it is not an injustice because the punishment owing to sin is death. You see that right in Genesis 2. You disobey, you will surely die. And yet, we are still alive. If we are still alive, that is of grace. And if the people of Jerusalem were still alive, that is of grace. And they should receive it as such. You know, in, in the Hebrew understanding, when you die, that is the end of hope. I don't know if you've noticed that in the Psalms, like the, the worst thing is when you go down into Sheol. In death, there is no remembrance of you. In Sheol, who will sing your praises? Cries out David in, I think it's Psalm 6. That is, that is the end of all hope. That is the full stop on the sentence of your life. But if the full stop has not yet been written, there's still the chance that God would write a but. And there, therefore, there may yet be hope, as we talked about last week. And so if we are still alive, why should we complain? Why should we grumble against God that he has been unfair to us? Yes, we can cry out to him in our angst, in our suffering, in our anguish. But not in that sense of grumbling. Because the final end has not yet been written. And God may turn our stories around. So the Lord does see. But secondly, the poet then goes on to tell us, or to tell them rather, what they should do until the Lord sees. And the call is to lift hands and hearts. Now this is, um, I'm looking here now at verse 40 to, to 51. And as we wait for God to see, God has given us this great opportunity for self-reflection. And suffering should always be a prompt for self-reflection. Not only that, but not less than that either. Of course, Jerusalem's suffering, as we've noted several times, um, is a result of her sin. So when he says they should not complain it because of the punishment of their sins, it takes on a, a kind of a special force that may not apply to us. When we face affliction, it may not be a result of our sins. But still, Jesus says, if you remember when, when some of the disciples approach him and they talk to him about the, the Tower of Siloam, which had fallen on several people and they died, and he says, do you think these were worse sinners? Do you think they were worse than you? No. Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Like, the suffering of others is itself a call to self-examination and to repentance. Not just our own suffering. And that was immediately after saying, they didn't deserve it any more than anyone else. It's not just deserved suffering that should cause us to examine ourselves and to repent. Even undeserved suffering should prompt us to move in that direction. And so the poet counsels his fellow sufferers. Let us test and examine our ways and so return to the Lord. And those words that test and examine, they mean to kind of search or spy out something that's maybe hidden or, or unknown. Um, like David, when the king of the Ammonites died and the, the kingship passed to his son, David sent a delegation to, to comfort them. But what were they accused of? They were accused of examining the land. To search out its weaknesses to see how they would go forward in attacking. Same word used there. That's uh, First Chronicles 19.3. The, the word is often also used with a more kind of moral examination. So for example, the Israelites in Deuteronomy 13.14, they're, they're commanded when you hear that a particular city has gone astray and they're advocating worshipping foreign gods, make an examination. See if these things are true and deal accordingly. That's the kind of idea that's going on here. Jeremiah is told by God, I, the Lord, search, the word there is the same word that's translated examine in our, in our passage, I, the Lord, search the heart and test, that's a different word, 
the mind to give every man according to his ways. Jeremiah 17.10 God has already uncovered every hidden thing in our hearts and in the people's hearts. If they've dealt in injustice and oppression, he has known it. If they've mocked and attacked the righteous, it's not hidden from him. If they've perverted their ways, those ways lie open to God. But above all, the sin that Jeremiah condemns is not injustice or oppression. He does condemn them, don't get me wrong. But above all, the sin that Jeremiah focuses on is turning away from the Lord. To trust in something else. And isn't that the essence of all sin? Now listen to a section from just a few verses earlier in the same chapter 17 that I've just quoted. Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He's like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched land, in the parched places of the wilderness, sorry, and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. The contrast now. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes, for its fruit le- for its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. That might sound familiar, very much like Psalm 1. Uh, interestingly enough, instead of contrasting the man who delights in God's law with the man who walks according to other ways, here he's, Jeremiah is contrasting the man who trusts the Lord with the man who trusts in man. But notice that bearing fruit, bearing good fruit, is based on trusting in the Lord. And bearing no fruit is a result of trusting in man. Our heart's position with respect to God is what determines whether we are going to be fruitful or fruitless. So the oppression comes out of a prior turning away from the Lord. So back in Jeremiah 17, the conclusion is this, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be put to shame. Those who turn away from you shall be written in the earth, for they have forsaken the Lord the fountain of living water. To turn away from the Lord results in condemnation. What's the appropriate response then? It's obvious. Return to God. Test and examine our ways. See the ways in which our failure to trust in God have caused us to turn aside from His paths and then return. Return to the Lord. That is what the poet calls them to do. And it's not just with words, it's not just with outward signs, it's not just bowed knees and raised hands. No, let us lift up our hearts and hands, verse 41, to God in heaven. Another, tra- another commentator has suggested it might actually be better to translate it, let us lift our hearts, not our hands. But either way, this is a full return to God. It's not oh, I regret this because this resulted. And we'll see that in a moment. But it's a full return with all of the heart. It's what Moses commanded back in Deuteronomy 30. He told the people, you will turn away. You will experience the covenant curses of Deuteronomy 28. God is never caught by surprise. He knew that uh, the destruction of Jerusalem in 587 BC was coming as far back as Moses. And of course, Father God. But if they would return to to the Lord with their whole hearts, God would circumcise those very hearts and he would deliver them from their enemies. He would make a new covenant with them. That was his promise. If only you will just return with your hearts. Solomon makes a very similar prayer and his prayer is kind of based to some extent on Deuteronomy 28 and Deuteronomy 30. And he prays this, if they repent with all their mind and with all their heart, same word, and repent is return, it's the same thing, in the land of their enemies, then hear in heaven your dwelling place their prayer and their plea, and maintain their cause and forgive your people who have sinned against you. Return to the Lord. 
And of course, God accepts the prayer that Solomon makes. So in the first half of the chapter, what we saw was that hope returned to the people, or, or rather to the poets, when his heart was reminded of God's heart. But now he's saying, now take your renewed heart back to God. Return your heart to God. So first, return the truth of God, the truth about God's heart to your heart, then return that heart to God. I'm just trying to bring out the, the nuances that you would, you would see if you were reading it in Hebrew, because it's just those three words, heart, return, and the Lord. Those are the three words that are being used uh, time and again throughout this, this passage. Then we, be, the, then we begin to see uh, Jerusalem apparently follow uh, the directive that they've been given. We see some, some form of repentance. We have transgressed and rebelled. It lasts a whole half of a verse before they go back to complaints. And we've seen this before, right? We've seen that they, they don't seem to be really lamenting the way we would hope they would. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. But even the content of what they're saying, there's nothing very original here. We saw killing without mercy in chapter 2, verse 21. We saw wrapping with a cloud in chapter 2, verse 1. We saw prayers that haven't, don't seem to be going through in chapter 3, verse 8. We saw enemies opening their mouths in chapter 2, verse 16. Almost all of what they're complaining about, it's nothing new. And we understand, right? When we face affliction, we don't only say the same thing once. We say it several times. There's a couple of ideas that are slightly different than what has been said before. We have become, uh, you have made us scum and garbage. And the idea there is things that are completely unwanted, completely unuseful. Like the things that you just want to throw away. That's how they are in the midst of the nations. This nation that was called to be a light to the Gentiles, this nation that was called to be a blessing to the ends of the earth, has become utterly useless. The idea of panic and pitfall is, we've seen the idea of a hunter before. The, the, the nuances here are slightly different, but it's the picture of a hunter who basically sets traps. And then he chases the prey, the, the, the prey runs in terror, and of course falls into one of the traps. That's the idea of panic and pitfall. Devastation and destruction. Again, going back to things we've, we've already seen. And once again, we're lacking really the key that makes lament, lament. If you remember way back to, to the time we were looking at chapter 1, I mentioned four key characteristics of most biblical laments. Okay? Calling upon God, complaining to God, crying for help from God, com uh, communicating trust in God, and possibly a fifth one, confessing sin against God. The fifth one is kind of a bit optional. Um, but the four are, if you read pretty much any lament psalm, you will see those four aspects. You notice in Jerusalem's speech, you really don't see that. Once again, and we've seen that in chapter 1, we've seen that in chapter 2. There's no expression of trust. There's no even, you don't know what they're asking from God. They don't, of course they want an end to what's happened, but they don't express what they would have God do for them. And I would say this is really just, this is what lifting hands looks like. Of course they want an end to the suffering. But they're not returning to the Lord with their whole hearts, not yet. Nothing particularly unusual about this kind of prayer. It's the prayer that any unbeliever really could make. Lord, we want it to end. You've done this, you've done this, you've done this. And we want it to end. And even though we want it to end, it's implied. It's not actually stated. It's not really what the poet, I think, is calling for. He shows us what he's calling for. He goes on and describes his own response in verses 48 to 51, which look much more like the lifting of heart than the mere lifting of hands. His response is very similar to what we already saw in, in chapter 2, verse 11, and that response itself echoes Jeremiah 14, 17, let my eyes run down with tears 
night and day. Let them not cease, for the virgin daughter of my people is shattered with a great wound, with a very grievous blow. And in that passage, the prophet Jeremiah goes on immediately, almost immediately to say, We acknowledge our wickedness, O Lord, the iniquity of our fathers, confession of sin, for we have sinned against you. Do not spurn us, calling out for help from God, crying out for help from God. Do not spurn us for your name's sake. Do not dishonor your glorious throne. Remember and do not break your covenant with us. Are there any among the false gods of the nations that can bring rain? Or can the heavens give showers? Are you not he, O Lord our God? We set our hope on you, communicating trust in God. For you do all these things. You see how Jeremiah's cry in, in, in Jeremiah 14 really is a true lament. And I believe the point that the, the, the poet here is making by describing his own reaction in very similar words is that this is the content of his crying. He's not just crying because Jerusalem got caught in sin and was judged. No, he is grieving over the sin itself. And he is hoping in God. He is lifting his heart, not merely his hands. And he commits to do that until the Lord finally sees. Spot that in verse 50, until the Lord from heaven looks down and sees. No rest for me, no respite, no ceasing to my tears. And he goes on immediately to say, my eyes, literally you could translate it, my eyes afflict me at the fate of all the daughters of my city. Like, it is painful to cry this much. That is what he's saying. And yet I will go on and I will go on until the Lord sees. Because the Lord cannot forever just watch on as his people are mourning in such a way. Of course the point is not that God is currently unaware of it. And, and, and the poet's own grief is going to make God, uh, is going to give some new information to God that he did not have before. No. Our prayers do not bring to God's attention anything that he is previously unaware of. There is no lack to God's knowledge of all things. But a lot of words like like this, uh, I'll give you a few examples. A lot of words like this that in English are rather passive, become rather, oh, not really become, they are rather more active in Hebrew. For example, when the Bible talks about the people did not hear God's word, what it really means is they didn't rightly respond to God's word. They didn't obey God. It doesn't mean that they lacked hearing. When it says God does not know the way of the wicked, it doesn't mean that this is some some, uh, great lack in his omniscience. He is fully aware of their way, but he does not approve of their way. That's the meaning there. And, And so on and so forth. When it says here, until the Lord looks down and sees, he is not saying until he becomes aware of what's going on. God is already aware. He's saying, until the Lord does something about this, I will keep on weeping. Until God delivers his people. Which will be according to his own sovereign timeline. And the poet knows that. The poet knows he can't twist God's arm to make him move faster. But he's praying that God would renew his works. Kind of like uh, Psalm 102. It says, let this be recorded for a generation to come, so that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord, that he looked down from his holy height, from heaven the Lord looked at the earth to hear the groans of the prisoners, to set free those who are doomed to die, that they may declare in Zion the name of the Lord. And the poet is saying, yeah, Lord, look down and see and set free those who are doomed to die. The prisoners, which would remind us back of verse 34, And this kind of weeping is very much an act of faith. Faith that God will not go unmoved at the distress of his people, not only at their injustice, but even their repentance. That he will not go unmoved. Lament, we've said before, is the language of faith when confronted with affliction. And that's exactly what we see in the poet. And what we don't really see in the people yet. We're going to get there. As we've said before, grief and afflict and going through suffering is a process. You don't 
flip a switch and all of a sudden everything is okay and you can, you know, lament the way you're supposed to. That's not how it works. One author has commented like this, and, and the comment is on Job, but I found it very uh, appropriate to, to this passage as well. Let Job, the patient sufferer, be your model, so long as that is possible for you. But when you cannot bear that any longer, let your grief and anger and impatience direct you towards God. For he is ultimately the origin of the suffering, and it's only through encounter with him that the anguish can be relieved. The author, what the author is saying there is, if you've reached that point where you can lament faithfully as you should, great. If you've not reached that point, still press in to God. Don't try and go anywhere else. Express what you feel towards God to Him. That's the point. Our third point today, God has seen. And there we're looking at verse 52 through 66. The poet turns to his own experience to encourage his people that the Lord will surely see and will surely therefore deliver. And you might wonder how I came to the conclusion that that's what the poet is doing. That he doesn't actually say that that's what he's, he's doing. He's using himself as an example. Um, but what I did was basically just track a few words. Um, and basic, most of the words that are used in 34 to 36 are repeated in this section. This is, he describes himself as having been denied justice. He describes his cause as having been subverted. He doesn't use the word prisoners, but he is clearly taken prisoner in this section. That is, and, and, and so, in the fact that the Lord saw him, and we'll see that in verse 59 and 60, in the fact that the Lord saw him in that, that is an encouragement to his people to continue crying out in the knowledge that the Lord will see them. Now, uh, I've been hesitant to do this, but uh, if we assume for the moment that the author was Jeremiah, and I've mentioned the book was written anonymously, we don't know for sure, but I think it's, it's, there are a lot of ways in which he is echoing the words of Jeremiah and even the experiences of Jeremiah. I think it's, a, it's very likely that he, he was the author. Um, and so I'm going to press into that for a few moments here. Uh, we can't be certain, but I think it's, like I say, it's very likely. Um, so it seems like, if that's the case, he is really describing the situation that he faced in chapter 38 of Jeremiah. Now, going back to chapter 37, which is where it kind of began... He was falsely accused of trying to escape Jerusalem and to desert them and to go to the Babylonians. That was a false accusation, but nevertheless he was taken as a prisoner. And then uh, he pleaded his case or presented his case to the king, Zedekiah, who was actually the last king of Judah before uh, Jerusalem fell. And he pleaded his case and, and Zedekiah said, okay, and moved him to a slightly more comfortable lodging, still kind of in prison, but at least in a better situation. But then Jeremiah made the, the fatal mistake, and I don't really think it was a mistake, but according to his enemies, it would have been a fatal mistake of starting to preach to the people and tell them, submit to the Babylonians. Join them. Surrender yourselves to them. And then the Lord will give you your lives. But if you stay here, it is not going to go well for you. He preaches that message, and four, four guys who are, who are named there at the beginning of chapter 38 decide, no, we can't, we can't stand this. This guy is weakening the resistance of the city. We can't allow that. And so they, they again ask for the king to permit them, and the king uh, gives them permission, and they go and they put him in a cistern. A cistern, a storage tank, for, an underground storage for water. Um, and and uh, a guy called Ebed, Ebed Mele, which literally means servant of the king, um, and he was an African, by the way, Ebed Melech, the Ethiopian. When you read Ethiopia in the Bible, it probably is more like Sudan than Ethiopia, as we understand it in modern day. Anyway, that's a, a lesson that you didn't need to know. But Ebed Melech eventually hears that this guy has been put in a cistern, and he's like, the guy's going to starve. Who's going to give him any food? We don't know how long later this is, but he asks for permission from the king and goes and, and rescues um, rescues Jeremiah from the pit. Now, one part of the account that maybe doesn't tie in so closely between Jeremiah 38 and Lamentations 3 is that in, in Lamentations 3 we read, water closed over my head. In Jeremiah 38 there was no water in the cistern. 
um, and he sunk into mud at the bottom of it. However, that's not really a big deal because, uh, in terms of reconciling the two accounts, because water closing over my head is a very common picture that the psalmists would use of the fact that they feel they've been condemned to death. So, for example, Psalm 69, David cries out, Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters and the flood sweeps over me. We don't have any account of David facing such a situation in the literal sense, uh, as far as I'm aware. But the point is that, is, that is the picture that someone gives when they feel like the condemnation of death is upon them. Water closing over them. So he feels himself, uh, Jeremiah, inexorably moving towards death. He feels the sentence of death is upon him. That's the point of his words at the end of 54. I am lost. So what Lamentations really adds to the account of Jeremiah 38, assuming they are talking about the same situation, is, is really the sense of despair that the prophet felt in the pit with no hope of rescue, but also the desperation with which he cried out to God. The fact that when Ebed Melech came, he really received it as, as God's intervention, God's own hand working salvation for him. So even in his own personal situation, he remembered the very fact that he was alive, they flung me alive into the pit, was a reason not to complain against God, but to cry out all the more to him while he was still alive. He followed his own advice to return to the Lord. Not necessarily because he had sinned, but he still renewed that relationship. His only crime was to speak boldly and clearly the word of God. They were his enemies without cause. Um, you get that in verse 52. But still, he found it appropriate to return to the Lord. To cry and plead for help until the Lord would see him. And the Lord did see him. He saw the wrong done. Verse 59. He saw the vindictiveness of the foes. Verse 60. Who laughed at his pain. He saw the plots of those who desired to find any way to bring this man down. Verse 60 still. He heard their mocking and jeering at him. Verse 61. And so the man who was thrown into the pit with life intact... He felt the sentence of death upon him, but his life was actually redeemed. See that in verse uh, 58. And so one, one scholar has put it like this. As he trusts the Lord, he finds a renewed relationship with God. And his firm conviction is that the nation as a whole will find the same thing to be true. So he's using, again, like I said, he's using his own example uh, so that the, the, his, his countrymen can learn from it. They can learn what he has learned and come back to the Lord. But there's also a sense in which the Lord doesn't seem to have finally dealt with the injustice that has been done. And that brings us back to where we began the message. Yes, God has delivered his life, but amidst those statements of, of great joy, there are still some statements requesting that God would judge his cause. Verse 59. That he would behold their sitting and their rising. Verse 63. It seems that, yes, uh, the poet had been delivered, but not yet had justice been done to those who opposed him without cause. He has been vindicated, but his enemies have not yet been brought to justice. And that ties in very, very nicely with Jeremiah 38, because the four men who put Jeremiah in the pit, in the cistern, we never read their names again in the book of Jeremiah. We never see anything being done to them. But the poet remains convinced that this will happen. You will repay them, O Lord, according to the work of their hands. And this is a very common idea in the Bible, that someone is repaid according to the very thing that they did. It's like a very clear system of justice. Maybe the most memorable example, there are many, many examples I could give, but maybe the most memorable is when Haman constructs a gallows to put Mordecai to death. And it turns out he's just constructing his own gallows. He thought he was getting the upper hand over his enemy, and then he's hung on those very gallows. 
David summarizes the point very nicely in Psalm 37, verses 14 and 15. The wicked draw the sword and bend their bows to bring down the poor and needy, to slay those whose way is upright. Their sword shall enter their own hearts. We saw another example in the psalm that, that was, was read for us earlier. Um, where was this? Oh, goodness. Okay, it was there somewhere. Um, I can't see it right now. Sorry about that. But another example that they fall in the pit or the, into the net that they have, they have laid in my way. They thought they would trap me in their net, but they themselves become trapped in it. A very common idea. God is completely just, and so he uses a person's sin as the measure for the judgment that he will bring against that. And, and he brings, therefore, an absolutely fitting judgment. But when we get to verse 65, you realize actually the bigger danger is not when we see the judgment or we see the justice. It's when no justice is seen. The next stage of punishment, verse 65, you will give them dullness of heart. Now, the word dullness there is not used anywhere else in the entire Old Testament. Um, But what it probably means is like hardness of heart. Like what Romans 1 would say, the Lord just gave them up to their own sin. And when he does that, that is the end of all hope. Because no longer will, is there any hope that someone will return to the Lord. If God has just given them, he said, it's okay. If that's, if that's your decision, you just continue with your sin. There's, there's no more feeling of the weight of sin in the heart. There's no more turning to the Lord. And what remains is just verse 66, being pursued in anger and destroyed. In that sense, suffering can be a real blessing. And prosperity can be a curse. Not because of the things in themselves. Suffering is bad and Prosperity is good, objectively speaking, but what they can work in us can be to us a blessing or a curse. When we face suffering, sometimes that brings us face to face with ourselves. It causes us to test and examine our ways before the Lord and return to Him. And that is a blessing when it happens. Perhaps some of us would never have thought of coming to church. Perhaps some of us would never even have become believers if the Lord had not first afflicted us and showed us that there is so much wrong Not only with the world, but inside of ourselves. And in that sense, affliction can be a blessing. Sometimes it's just the wake-up call we need. Maybe some of you are here right now because the Lord has not yet given you dullness of heart. And what you need to do is to take that suffering and return to the Lord with it. To cry out to Him. This world is not what it was created to be. Suffering will one day be at an end. But as long as it endures, it has this value that it can cause us to return to the Lord. And that doesn't mean that the suffering will go away necessarily. It doesn't mean that as soon as you turn to the Lord, everything will be made well. I mentioned last week, based on, based on just basic chronology and age spans of human beings, Jeremiah did not live to see Jerusalem restored. I'm sure he was probably crying on his deathbed that he still hadn't seen that the Lord had seen. But the Lord does see. That is the promise that we have in the midst of suffering. And that in itself is a great comfort. I don't know if you remember the story of Hagar, uh, Sarai's maidservant, and Sarai was looking around, she's like, okay, this baby is not coming. So let me make sure that my husband gets an heir. And so she sends uh, Hagar to Abraham, or Abram as he was being called at that time. And, and after that she conceives, she's, she's, she's pregnant with a baby, and she starts being contemptuous of Sarah, mocking her probably, because all this time we thought that the problem was Abram, Kumbe, the problem was you. Abraham was perfectly capable, but you were the problem. Those are probably the kind of things that she was saying. And so Hagar, uh, after that, uh, Sarai mistreats her, treats her very badly, and Hagar flees. And who is there to meet her in the wilderness but the angel of the Lord? He doesn't give her a great uh, comforting message that, 
go back to your, your mistress and everything will be well with you. No, go back to your mistress. That's where I've called you to be. And as for this son that you're going to bear, he's going to be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone. Everyone's hand will be against him. He shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. And you think, what kind of a response is Hagar going to give? She blesses the God who has seen her. That's the comfort of being seen by God. Not that our situations are necessarily going to change, but that he knows those situations. And in the right time, he will deal with them. Now, last week, we touched a little on the idea that Jesus took on the experience of suffering that the man of of chapter 3, verse 1, had himself experienced in order both to demonstrate and to secure the ongoing steadfast love of God for his people. I want to revisit that idea again. Now let me say something about why I'm doing so. I'm not doing that because I think Lamentations is a prophecy in some sense about Christ. Not at all. I'm doing this um, it's because Lamentations gives us this kind of a almost comprehensive view of suffering. And as such, it's appropriate to, to think, okay, how does this apply How how does this text apply to Christ, and how does it apply to us who are in Christ? And that's how we should be trying to to read the Old Testament. Like, how does this apply to them? How does it apply to Christ, and then how does it apply to us after Christ? Because we shouldn't naturally just assume that everything will be the same. In fact, everything is changed with the coming of Christ. But scholars have noted... The fall of Jerusalem in 587 BC kind of shows us in some limited, in some temporal way, what it looks like when God's wrath falls down in one moment of time. And we don't see this so often. Most of the time, we don't necessarily even know, is this God's judgment? Is this God, like, how how are we supposed to pass those details? We We don't know, but in 587 BC, we know very clearly, this is what it looks like when God's wrath comes down against a sinful people. And that's the fate towards which we would all be moving. We are no better than these guys who face such things. We would be moving towards the same fate, except it wouldn't be just for a moment in time. It wouldn't be just Nebuchadnezzar came and he sacked the city. It would be for all eternity. In chapter 4, the the, the poet compares the destruction of Jerusalem with the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And he says that Jerusalem's fate was much worse because Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed in but a moment. But even the 70 years that Israel spent in exile is but for a moment compared with the eternal fate towards which we would be heading were it not for the fact that Christ himself came and took the stroke of God's judgment in a moment. So I think it's very appropriate for us to connect the dots between the destruction of Jerusalem as recorded for us in Lamentations and the death of Christ. Jesus shares some things very much in common with the man of Lamentations 3. As we noticed last week and we've seen again a little bit today, This man did not experience the affliction that he faced as a direct result of his sin. He was what we might call a righteous sufferer. Not to mean that he didn't sin, of course he did, but he didn't suffer as a result of that sin. He suffered because of his close association with, or to use a term that we sometimes use in the New Testament, his union with his people. His fate is one with their fate. He fell under the rod of God's wrath because he wouldn't abandon them. Because they were his people and he would share in what they took. And he also faced the injustice that we've seen in this chapter and the abandonment to death because he would not stop preaching the truth. Assuming it's Jeremiah speaking. But when he cried out to God as the water closed about him. Now this is the interesting thing. When it says in verse 57 that the Lord spoke to the man, do not fear, those are the 
only words that God speaks in the entire book of Jeremiah, of Lamentation, sorry. The only words. Do not fear. But when you come to Jesus, God has been speaking to him and through him throughout his life. And then he gets to the moment where he is to take the rod of God's wrath and there is no comfort to him. There are no words. He experiences the silence of heaven for the first time. He experienced the silence that pervades the rest of lamentation. He saw the devastation and destruction on his own body that had fallen upon Jerusalem. The water literally, okay, not literally, sorry. The water figuratively did close over his head. When he cried out to the Lord for deliverance, that deliverance did not come. At least not before he went down into Sheol, where he was utterly lost. As the man would say in verse 54, he experienced no respite. And what a blessing for us that he did because he has drunk to the very dregs the cup of God's wrath. There is none left. For those who are in Christ, there is none left to drink. There is no punishment for the elect. No wrath against them. But not only so. We're coming next week towards Easter. When we will remember that Jesus also emerged from the pit. The pit into which he was placed. He was not brought out by Ebed Meleth. He was brought out by the Holy Spirit of God himself. God finally vindicating him. God showing that those who sentenced him to death were his enemies without cause. And yet Jesus cries out not for judgment against them. His words are not the words of 64 to 66. His words are very different. He cries out that God would pay them according to the work of his own hands. He cries out that God would give them fullness of the Spirit in their hearts. He cries out that God's blessing would be upon them. He cries out that God would pursue them in grace. And keep them and bring them into his heavens. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that God will all of a sudden not see injustice. It remains abhorrent to him. But it does mean that those who have carried out injustice or any other sin can find a refuge. Isn't it true that we so often want the perpetrators of injustice against us to be dealt with? But we don't want ourselves to be dealt with. But the poet tells us, let us first test and examine our own hearts, our own ways, and return to the Lord rather than being quick to hand out judgment to others. And so we turn to our reflection question for today. Is the fact that the Lord sees all injustice a comfort or a warning to you? Those verses back in 34 to 36, I know we covered them some time back. But do you perceive those as a comfort? That... Injustice will one day be dealt with. That the Ukrainian lives which are suffering will one day be vindicated. That those who suffered post-election violence will one day see justice come to the, to the perpetrators. Or is it a warning to us? And I would suggest it ought to be both. Our suffering should not only prompt us to long for God's justice. It should prompt us to also reflect, to test and examine our ways, and in that sense to flee from the justice that would be deserved by us and to flee unto Christ. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we are grateful. We are grateful to see the picture of suffering painted so vividly And yet to know that even in the midst of such suffering, of such injustice that you see, 
and that you will vindicate those who have been unjustly treated. We're grateful that you care for those for whom no one else cares, that you see their tears, you hear their cries. We pray that you would set this world to rights, and we pray that you would do it soon. We know that that means that we're really praying a prayer that Christ would come soon. For that is the time when we will see all things made right. But in the meantime, Lord, help us not to be quick to deal out judgment to others, but to be swift to test and examine our own ways. To return to you where we have faltered in our trust of you, where we have failed in doing your will, to take refuge in the death of Christ, in which he absorbed your wrath fully and finally, so that we would not have to. And we pray that his attitude of loving kindness, even towards his enemies, would pervade our lives. Not that we don't long for justice, but that we would continually plead that in your justice remember us. So help us, Lord. This book has been very heavy. It has reminded us of things that we would rather run away from. Help us to not run away from them, but to turn to you. To turn all of our afflictions and all of our griefs and all of our struggles to you. Knowing that you do see and that in the right time you will surely Respond rightly. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is right? Surely he shall. We put our hope in it. In Christ's name.